So last time we looked at how the five hindrances keep us stuck in our practice and in our lives. We explore different ways of relating and working with them in order to free ourselves from their grip. The next Dhamma, or universal category of phenomena, in this fourth foundation of mindfulness, is the teaching on the five aggregates, or skandhas. This teaching goes to the core insight of the Buddha. It provides a framework for investigating how we create and maintain our self-image, which is at the root of our suffering. Simply put, the five aggregates represent the basic building blocks of our entire subjective experience. They are the material and mental factors that make up our sense of self. And when we cling to these factors, we reinforce the identification, which leads to resistance and suffering. This is why they're known as the five aggregates of clinging. The first aggregate is rupa, often translated as material form. Today we understand matter in terms of chemical elements ordered by the periodic table. And this is no doubt a very precise and refined map of the basic building blocks that make up material form. But rupa points to a different understanding of matter, a different truth. It shouldn't be understood as static, dead stuff out there, you know, separate from our experience. It's more like the felt sense of physical form. Rather than thinking of physical form in terms of atoms and molecules, we think of it in terms of qualities of sensation, represented by the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. And although we may not think of it as scientifically sophisticated, this teaching is an invitation to shift our perspective on what matter is, what matters. We use the four elements, which in turn are broken down into more refined levels, in order to connect with the direct experience of material form. As an example, our physical body is rupa. And if we think of the body as an independently existing object, consisting of atoms and molecules, divided into certain anatomical parts, as being a certain age with a certain gender, we live in the world of concepts. And although these concepts and labels may be very precise and tremendously useful, they create a separation between the mind and matter, and they tend to disconnect us from the felt sense of material form. And if we get stuck in this world of concepts, we tend to solidify and hold on to them. And since the body is always changing, clinging and identification inevitably leads to resistance and dissatisfaction. And this goes for all material form. So in this way, the first aggregate of clinging constitutes a key link in the chain of suffering. So we can look at this teaching as a psychotechnology to help us see beneath the surface level of our concepts and labels. And when we look deeply into our experience, we don't see the body as a thing that belongs to me. We don't even find arms and legs and organs or age or gender. If we look deeply, we find a cascade of ever-changing sensations and energies appearing in space. And we feel these tactile sensations as the solidity of the earth element, the heat of fire, the cohesion of water, the movement of air, and so on. And as our mindfulness deepens, we become increasingly aware of the aliveness that lies underneath our thoughts and ideas about the body. We see the truth of impermanence in our own direct experience, and we feel the suffering, dukkha, that follows when we resist it. Next is Vedana, which refers to the qualitative taste of experience, our ability to discern and distinguish between pleasure and pain. And we already went into some depth on this in the second foundation of mindfulness, where we explored the link between the body and these hedonic tones. 
and this understanding is further emphasized in this teaching on the aggregates. Remember, rupa can be understood as the felt sense of physical form, and this includes sense objects, for example sound waves or odorant particles in the air. Whenever we become conscious of the contact between a sense object and our sense organ, a pleasant, unpleasant or neutral sensation arises. We see a beautiful sunset and we get a pleasant sensation. Or we smell a rotten egg and we have an unpleasant reaction. So this is how Rupa leads to Vedana. Vedana is singled out as the second foundation of mindfulness as well as the second aggregate because it provides fertile ground for clinging and aversion. It's a key link in the chain of suffering which really makes it worth paying attention to. Through the practice of mindfulness and the cultivation of equanimity, we can cut the chain at this level. We begin to see feelings for what they are, and we can allow their changing nature without putting up a fight. And when there's no resistance, no clinging, we find space and freedom. The Buddha said, Whatever feelings arise, whether unpleasant, pleasant or neutral, abide contemplating impermanence in those feelings. Contemplate fading away, letting go of those feelings. Contemplating thus, we don't cling to anything in this world. When there's no clinging, there's no agitation. When not agitated, we personally attain nirvana. The third aggregate is samnya, or sanya which translates to perception. It refers to the mind's ability to perceive and categorize our experience. And this factor is also singled out as a separate aggregate because clinging to perceptions it play a key role in the conditioning of the mind. Just like feeling tones, perception arises out of contact with sense object. As soon as we become aware of contact, whether it's a sound, sight, smell, touch, taste, or a mental phenomena like a thought, feelings and perceptions arise automatically. When we open our eyes, we don't simply see a raw, undifferentiated ocean of sense impressions. We see a screen. We see furniture, a window, trees, people. And when we listen, when we take in sound, we don't just get a random auditory experience. We hear traffic birdsong, voices, refrigerators. Our experience comes pre-packaged into familiar boxes. This is the process of perception. This faculty of the mind to recognize and categorize has great value. Perceptions help us frame our experience and focus our attention on what's considered relevant. It serves as a cognitive shortcut, you know, recognition that gives us guidance on how to respond to our surrounding. And we can even use perceptions to arouse mindfulness. One practice is to note and name each perception as we become aware of them in order to stay mindful, stay with our current experience. As we go about our day, for example, we might note the sight of a tree, the smell of food, the sensation of hunger, the feeling of restlessness, and so on. And by noting our perceptions in this way, we increase the vividness of what we're aware of. The danger comes when we cling to perception. When this faculty is not paired with mindfulness, we easily get caught in the world of concepts. We start relating to the superficial labels without seeing the deeper experience that underlie them. When we see a tree, we don't fully perceive a complex living organism coexisting with its environment, we see a familiar image and we label it and move on. And when we relate to another person, we typically don't perceive them as they are in that moment. We see their persona, their mask, and we have all kinds of ideas and memories that limit our experience of them. We don't see that they constantly grow and change. We feel like they're just the same old person and in a way we don't allow them to be anything else. From this level of relating, other people are turned into means of getting what we want. Our experience of the world becomes flat and static 
and can cause us to act out harmful behavior. The clinging to perceptions is what leads to the division between us and them. This clinging and identification with perception have caused tremendous harm and suffering throughout history. Think about the effects of fixed ideas around countries and boundaries and racial groups and religions. When these perceptions become sufficiently ingrained in our mind, we take them to be absolutely real. We superimpose value judgments and we justify just about any behavior that is aligned with those value systems. So perceptions have a tremendous power. And some perceptions are especially deep and dense in our psyche. One of them is time. The idea that our lives play out on a timeline with the past, present and a future. And this is such a useful framing of our experience that we often ignore and overlook our actual experience. It's like confusing the map for the territory. We take the past and future to possess some absolute reality, but have you ever experienced the past or the future? If we look into our own experience, they only ever show up as thoughts and ideas in the present moment. In the words of Albert Einstein, time and space are modes by which we think and not conditions in which we live. Perhaps the most essential of all concept is that of the self. In a way, this is the center on which all other perceptions depend. Everything is happening in relation to me. And again, this is not a mistake. You know, as we grow up, forming an ego, a self-image, is crucial for our capacity to interface with the world. But when we cling to this image and confuse it for who we are, we lose connection with our authentic self. We solidify and limit what in reality is a rich, ever-changing play of mental and material experiences. So, to summarize, the third skanda invites us to look deeply into the mechanics of perception in order to connect us with the reality that lies underneath. We see that images are fixed and solid, whereas the experience to which they're pointing is alive and always changing. We see, not intellectually, but experientially, how clinging to something that is inevitably changing causes dissatisfaction. The fourth aggregate is Sankara. And this term has a broad range of meanings and is sometimes translated as all conditioned things. So this is quite broad and complex term. It includes all the so-called mental factors which in Buddhist psychology refers to 52 aspects of the mind, including feelings and perceptions which are singled out as separate aggregates, which we just explored. So this aggregate can be understood as a collection of capacities that help us determine the quality of an object. It's what helps us determine how to relate to the world, and hence tend to color the mind in both helpful and harmful ways. Another way to understand the fourth aggregate is as intention or volition. This capacity, chetana in Sanskrit, is considered to be the most important of all the mental factors and is therefore sometimes used synonymously with sankara itself. So seen in this way, we could say that the fourth aggregate represents the part of our mind that is concerned with the actualization of our goals our volition, our personal will. So this is the next link in the chain of what we call dependent origination. And again, it all starts with sense contact. As an example, sound waves make contact with your eardrums and you become aware of sound. This is the first aggregate. Once you become conscious of sound, an uncomfortable sensation may occur. This is the second aggregate and you immediately recognize the sound as a fire alarm. This is the third aggregate of perception. From there, you have all sorts of associations and feelings toward the sound, and there's an immediate and emotional push toward action. And so this is how the fourth aggregate arises out of a response to our interpretation of perception. I repeat, volition arises out of a response 
to our interpretation of perceptions. And these volitions occur on different levels, in body, in speech, in mind. And they can be either skillful or unskillful, either ethical or unethical. So this is a really important point because this is what determines the fruit of our actions. In Buddhist language, Chetana is the most significant mental factor in generating karma. What we experience right now is the result of our volitions in the past. And our volitions in the present create our future. So this is really worth investigating. What are the motivations behind my actions? What seeds am I planting? And am I willing to bear the fruit of that? Over time, with life experience, we see more clearly the relationship between actions and outcome. For example, as we grow up, we see that if we only stay in the sofa, you know, drinking Coca-Cola, playing video games, we're unlikely to reach our dreams and goals. But we may still struggle to change our behavior because they're so deeply conditioned in the mind. So this is where the practice of mindfulness and meditation can help. As we learn to stay with what is, we see the motivations behind our actions with more clarity. We become aware of the arising of a volition and we gain the freedom to actually choose whether or not to act it out. As Joseph Goldstein says, we become aware of the about to moment. This moment right before we're about to act, right before we're about to say something or do something. And this is where we find freedom of choice, freedom to change our course, freedom to plant new types of seeds. So this is where freedom lies. So we can easily see how volition forms an aggregate of clinging. Right? We often have a particularly strong identification with our volition or personal will. Right? We identify with our actions, our performance, our competence, and we feel that we are the ones behind our intentions. I want, I must, I speak, I think, you know, and in a relative way this is all true. But as we look closer we find actually many contradicting impulses and volitions and parts of our psyche that are all kind of competing for the driver's seat, the seat of the self. And with mindfulness, we begin to experience this impersonal nature of volition. We see intentions and the various parts of our psyche as conditioned responses to past circumstances. We see how they arise and pass without any claim for our identity. And we see how our clinging to them as me or mine reinforces a self-image that creates resistance and suffering in the mind. The fifth aggregate is vijnana, or consciousness. We could call it the witness, the knowing quality which is present throughout all of our experience. Think about it. Consciousness is part of every experience we ever have. Now, the contents of awareness, like thoughts or moods, sense experience, keep changing, but the witness is continuous. It's like a mirror reflecting without being affected. So different traditions have different understandings of, of consciousness. Some emphasize a universal consciousness that stands behind everything. It's thought of as the substrate of all experience, that which everything is made of. And in this context, awakening is understood as the realization of this pure consciousness. In the mindfulness tradition, it's not seen quite that way. Here, consciousness is understood as arising and passing based on causes and conditions, just like the mental factors we just investigated. There are six different types of consciousnesses corresponding to the six senses. Right? So, for example, when a sense object, like odorant particles in the air, come into contact with a sense organ, let's say the nose, and there is a tension there, then smell consciousness arises. We become aware of smell. These are the causes and conditions for smell consciousness to arise. And from this viewpoint, our entire lives are 
like an orchestra of different sensory experience and mind moments arising and passing. But we tend to ignore this and we, we superimpose continuity on our experience. Joseph Goldstein gives another good example here that this is like watching a series of picture frames flicker through in rapid succession and seeing it as a continuous movie. You know, but as our mindfulness increases, we begin to see the individual frames and we see the rapidity of change, which gradually reveals consciousness as a distinct quality of our experience. Now, what do I mean by this? So normally we're only conscious of the object of our awareness. But as our mindfulness becomes stronger, we become aware of awareness itself. The knower and the known are distinct but not separable. As a kind of metaphor or, or example, look at an object in the room and notice that it has a color and it has a shape. The color is distinct from the shape, but you can't separate them. In the same way, the witness and the object are distinct, but not separable. So we're basically learning to take the position of the witness. We're becoming aware of this, almost like a separate entity, watching as our lives unfold. And we shift from the content of our awareness to becoming aware of the context of awareness. We begin to see each mind moment as a temporary, impersonal happening. The witness doesn't identify with thoughts or judgments, it's simply aware of them. From this place, everything is seen almost like a fleeting river with nothing to hold on to. And this experience can be unsettling from the ego's perspective because its very nature is to fixate and control, but it can also lead to a letting go, a sense of spaciousness and freedom and bliss. But even consciousness can be an aggregate of clinging. The ego tries to grab hold you know, of experiences, insights, states of consciousness. It even makes selflessness into another concept or some goal to be attained. So this is a reminder that the ultimate goal of this teaching, if we can call it that, is not to attain a certain state, is not to experience some wonderful feeling or to get high it's to liberate the mind. Through meditation and the practice of mindfulness, we gain access to deep truths about our experience, what we've called the three marks of existence. We get underneath the level of concepts and we cut through the illusion of solidity. We discover this truth of impermanence, of change, happening on every level at all times, whether we're looking at galaxies and star systems or the quantum level of reality. We see it happening collectively in societies and cultures, as well as subjectively our momentary thoughts and experiences. It all keeps changing. It arises, it changes, and it passes. The rate of change is perhaps particularly clear in today's digital age, where information exchange happens at an incredible rate. Everything is instantaneous and nothing lasts long enough to hold on to. So as we've explored in this frame, the truth of impermanence also applies to the aggregates. And by ignoring and resisting this truth, by taking the aggregates to be solid and permanent, we create contraction and fear. We desperately hold on looking for security and satisfaction where it cannot be found. So this is the second noble truth, that clinging leads to suffering. And to the degree that we identify with that which changes, we create dissatisfaction and suffering for ourselves. Again, there's no problem with the aggregates in themselves, only in our clinging to them. And we need to really internalize this experience is not about the content of our awareness, but about how we hold it. This is the difference between suffering and freedom. Thoughts, feelings, concepts, relationships, possession of objects are all part of life and we can enjoy them for what they are. 
But when we grasp after them, they start to control us. When we're not mindful of our thoughts or perceptions, for example, they possess tremendous power. We create stories and, and concepts in our mind that end up controlling us. We superimpose perceptions on top of changing experiences. And we act out of fear and a need to control and hold on to these concepts. By contrast, when we can see the aggregates for what they are, they actually become the vehicle of our awakening. We see thoughts and feelings arise and pass as selfless, temporary phenomena. We experience the body as a subtle energy flow, and our entire experience can become a joyful expression of the aggregates, simply rising and passing. And we don't have to wait in order to be mindful. We don't have to wait for any particular condition or situation or circumstance. Everything we encounter is potentially the object of our mindfulness. We can use this moment to look into the aggregates of clinging. And this is a shift in perspective. And in one sense, nothing really changes, and yet nothing remains the same. When we claim no ownership of the aggregates, we no longer suffer from the mistaken sense of self. And when we let go of ideas of solidity, we no longer suffer from the truth of change. Again, when there is no clinging, there is no agitation. When not agitated, we personally attain nirvana. Thank you.